Okay, so out of respect for everyone's time, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we may still have a few folks uh, trickle in as the event goes on, but uh, we're really excited that all of you have joined us tonight. Um, this is our very first virtual financial aid night here at Missouri State. Um, we hope it's a great event that you guys learn a lot and uh, certainly hope you brought your questions. Uh, to introduce myself, I am one of our hosts tonight. My name is Matt and I am one of the associate directors in the admissions office and I will let my co-host introduce himself. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for carving out just a bit of your time and your busy schedule to be with us. My name is Stephen Garman. I'm the one of two assistant directors in the financial aid office at Missouri State University. And guys, I'm going to go ahead and give a shout out to Steve because he just came from a FAFSA night at one of our local high schools. So he is a iron man in financial aid tonight. So um, again, you know, we hope you guys you know, learn a lot from this. We hope you brought your questions. I do have a few housekeeping notes that I want to talk about before we do jump into the presentation. And the first one actually does have to do with questions. Uh, you have a Q&A tab in your Zoom webinar. And anytime you do have a question, anytime anything comes up, we do hope you will use that tab and send us a question. Uh, we're going to try to answer those as the presentation goes along. But we also know that there may be some questions at the end, and it's really important to Steve and myself um, that we actually are able to um, answer as many questions as we possibly can. So uh, definitely please uh, put those in the Q&A. Uh, we also understand that you may need to leave early or you may wanna go back and watch specific pieces over again. And we are going to be recording this event and posting it on YouTube probably early next week, I would say you know, Monday or Tuesday, we're actually gonna email out everybody um, who attends with the link to the YouTube video. Uh, also, we do ask for a little bit of your time at the end, if you wouldn't mind, just to fill out a quick survey to tell us you know, how we've done tonight, as well as uh, tell us what we might do differently in the future. So please, uh, uh, if you would fill that out. And then one final thing, uh, we do have at different points in tonight's event, some polls. And those polls are really just there to help us uh, learn a little bit more about you, our audience, and also the things that you might be concerned about. And actually, uh, we're going to start right af off tonight by learning uh, just a little bit about everyone who's attending. So I'm going to launch the first poll. And I'll allow a little bit of time just so uh, folks can uh, go ahead and answer the questions. And then I will uh, show everybody the results. Okay, I did give it just a few more seconds here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and share our results. All right, so you can see um, just a little bit of breakdown of our attendees tonight. We've got, a, probably not surprising, about 70% uh, from here in Missouri. Uh, looks like most folks' number one concern, which is totally not, ex uh, not unexpected. It will be academic program and major. And uh, probably understandably as well, since you're here with us tonight talking about financial aid, um, it looks like 94% of folks uh, rate uh, cost at least as moderately or more um, as far as a concern with uh, the college search. So thank you everybody for your vote. And I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Steve. And once again, thanks, Matt. Good evening, everyone. Um, as Matt said, my name is Stephen Garman and I'm the assistant director at Missouri State University's financial aid office. 
I do a little bit of everything in this role, but my favorite part about my job is helping students find that one thing about their financial aid that they would otherwise not have known about. So maybe that's fixing an error on the FAFSA or introducing a scholarship to them that they can apply for. Now that we know who everyone is and we know who I am, let's get to talking about cost. The million dollar question, Oh, sorry, we'll back up a little bit. Um, before we talk about costs, let's talk about what financial aid means at Missouri State. I want to put some context behind the financial aid scene. You've heard the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child, and helping a student through the financial aid process is sort of like that. On campus, there are three financial offices that you will inevitably work with, and each has a separate purpose. Having said that, Missouri State is a welcoming place and anybody from these offices will gladly help you to the extent that they can. And if one department is not equipped to help you, they will certainly point you in the right direction. First, you have the Office of Student Financial Aid. Hi, that's us. We are primarily responsible for getting financial aid to students' accounts. That means dispersing it to your student account, getting it from the government. We also uh, are, we will be where you turn in scholarship checks. If you get a scholarship from a private organization, you'll bring the check to us and we will help you get it to your account. We also review FAFSAs, something to the order of about 40,000 a year. Uh, each FAFSA that is sent to Missouri State will come through our office, we'll review it. If there is something that jumps out that we think may need correcting or we need clarification on, we'll generally reach out to you and ask you to help us with that. And then we'll review other eligibility that uh, points on the FAFSA so that you're getting the best financial aid possible. The second department listed is Student Financial Services. They are like the billing office. So their responsibilities include emailing monthly statements to students. It's important to note that it, your statement is emailed to you every month and it's sent to your student email address or your bare mail account. It's not mailed and it's not sent to parents. They also answer any billing questions. So if you have a concern about what you're being billed for or why, they're the office you'll want to talk to. And they also oversee the My Payment Plan. We'll talk about the payment plan towards the end. The third and final office related to finances at the university is the bursar's office. And you can think of them as like the bank. This is where you would go if you're making a payment on campus in our actual bursar's office. They also oversee the online payment options. So if you have a question or need help making a payment on your account online, the bursar's office is going to be your go-to. The one office that's not listed is the admissions office, uh, but probably, there's probably no other office on campus with so much energy and passion for student success. The admissions office will also help you find your way to the right department if you aren't sure who on campus can answer your question. All right, now let's talk about cost. The million dollar question on everyone's mind is, what's it going to cost me to go to Missouri State? I can tell you that that answer is not easy to come up with. But fortunately, it's not a million dollars. What you see here is an average estimated cost for an undergraduate student this year. This is the annual estimated cost. It's an average and your actual cost may be different. Why would yours be different? For one thing, items like tuition and housing costs change every year. And most colleges and universities won't set these costs until they get closer to the start of the school year. So usually sometime in the spring or summer. Tuition, for example, generally increases slightly at Missouri State University each year to mirror the Consumer Price Index, or CPI. You can sort of think of it as an adjustment for inflation. CPI doesn't change a whole lot each year, so neither should the tuition and fees. We assess tuition per credit hour, so students taking more classes would expect to pay more for tuition. Other expenses such as books and supplies can vary greatly from student to student. For example, uh, as a music major in former life, I had very few books to buy when I was in college. So my expenses in this department were very low. If a student buys their books new, they'll probably spend a little bit more money on them than if they bought their books used. 
uh, students can also rent textbooks and save a little bit of money that way. So there's some flexibility that you have in designing your costs for the year. That's why it's difficult to come up with what it's actually gonna cost you to go to Missouri State. Parking pass is another example of a variable expense. Some students won't have a car on campus and won't need to buy a parking pass. So that may be something you do or don't have on your account. You'll notice that these costs are labeled direct and indirect. Direct just means something that you're likely going to be paying the university for, especially as a new student living in campus housing. Other expenses like books and supplies can be charged to your student account if you purchase your books at the campus bookstore, but you can also purchase your books and supplies somewhere else and the university is not going to bill you for that. And I mentioned how some students won't need a parking pass, so that would be considered an indirect expense. Direct expenses, generally the basics, tuition and fees and housing and meal plan. Another thing to consider that is not listed here is miscellaneous expenses like clothing, transportation, cloth for masks, and spending money. These are highly variable. These depend on your lifestyle. So again, some students may have low miscellaneous costs while others need to budget a little more in these areas. But overall, this is what your fees would typically look like as a Missouri State student. We've broken it down for Missouri residents and then our out-of-state students, although there's a way to snag the in-state rate, which we'll talk about in just a second. Okay, $18,000 may seem like a lot of money to pay, but notice how many types of financial aid are available to help you. This Mayan calendar thing breaks it down a little bit better. In the blue corner, we have the free stuff. Free is good. We like free. By free financial aid, we mean things you do not have to pay back. These can be institutional or private scholarships, state or federal grants, such as GI benefits and vocational rehab. I can tell you though, that nearly all of these quote free resources will require some sort of application like the FAFSA or a, or a separate scholarship app. Generally, it shouldn't cost you any money to apply for it, but there is a little bit of work involved. Matt will talk about Missouri State scholarships in just a minute, and we will talk about the FAFSA here shortly. Free is good, and you should always be on the lookout for scholarships and grants. But if that doesn't cover it, there are many federal and private loan options for both students and their parents. The FAFSA, which I mentioned before, stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And that is how students and parents receive federal loans. But the amount they can borrow is limited, especially for students. Federal student loans do not require any credit history if they're in the student's name, so they're easy to qualify for, which can be a double-edged sword. Great if you need it, but if you don't need it, then it's, it's a quick access to something not necessary, not necessary that can come back to haunt you if you're not keeping up on your payments. A loan from a private source, such as a bank or credit union or student loan lender, on the other hand, will usually require credit history. We hope that students will view borrowing as a last option. And if you do need to borrow loans for college, as many choose to do, we urge you to borrow only what is needed. And here we also mentioned work study, which we'll talk about a little later. Most of the time, financial aid sources can be combined with others or stacked as we call it. Keep looking for the free stuff, but don't rely on the loans. Okay, we're gonna go and talk about scholarships now. So we wanna get a feel for uh, what, your, what your feel about scholarships is. I believe we have a couple of questions for you. We'll give you just a few minutes to answer these.
So while we're getting those last few answers in, a popular question coming up is that price for tuition. How many credit hours is that for? That's an estimate. That's based on 28 credit hours per year or 14 per semester, which we have found to be an average course load. That's typically what our students take, especially as a first year student. But as I mentioned, if you take more credit hours, more classes, your costs are going to go up. If you're uh, taking less than 14 hours, you're probably going to see a little bit lower cost. Keep in mind, though, that for many financial aid options, you need to have at least 12 credit hours. So we try to tell, we, we caution students before they drop below 12, 12 hours. Okay, so there we have it. So a lot of you have been able to take the ACT or SAT at least once, which is great. If you didn't do too well, you might consider trying to take it again, although I know getting a test date can be a bit of a challenge in some circumstances. A lot of you do intend to apply for outside private scholarships, which is great. Keep in mind that there are lots and lots of scholarships to be had. There are lots of resources, which we'll discuss here shortly. Um, and you can stack or combine a lot of your outside scholarships with your state, federal, and institutional financial aid. Okay. So, you know, as Steve mentioned with his, uh, I like that, his Mayan calendar um, graphic, there is a lot of different aid from a lot of different places. And I do think what a lot of folks will think of first when you think of financial aid are going to be institutional scholarships, those scholarships that come from the university or the college that you plan on attending. And I think Steve hit the nail on the head. You do want to make sure you explore aid from all different sources and you don't just rely on one particular source. But as far as our scholarships, uh, I do wanna draw attention to that link that's there in the subtitle, missouristate.edu slash financial aid slash scholarships. There are a lot of details that go into our scholarship program, uh, whether you are a income, an incoming freshman student or an incoming transfer student. Uh, there are you know, different scholarship programs for both, but there again, just a lot of details. And there's not gonna be a quiz about any of the stuff we talk, to, uh, talk about tonight, but that website is going to have just an absolute um, you know, bevy of resources for you to check out. Uh, some of the key questions that you do want to make sure you ask as you look at some of the scholarships, you know, first and foremost, it's what do I need to have in order to, say, apply or at least be considered for a particular scholarship? What are the qualifications? You also need to ask, um, and Steve has mentioned this a couple times already, can that scholarship be stacked or can it be combined? And that means, you know, could you have multiple scholarships at the same time? Another question is, could the scholarship be renewed? Most uh, of our scholarships here at Missouri State are gonna be renewable for up to four years, but there are a couple exceptions and you do wanna make sure you understand uh, those differences. And then the final question that you wanna ask is, is there going to be a separate application process? And if there is a separate application process for that scholarship, do I then have a deadline where I need to make sure I do apply for a scholarship uh, to make sure I can be considered? And kind of using that as my jumping off point, I wanna draw attention first and foremost to the top three scholarships in this table. You can see the Presidential Scholarship, the Inclusive Excellence Scholarship, and the Hutchins SGA Centennial Leaders, or as we often refer to it, uh, the Centennial Leaders. Those are the three scholarships that we in admissions often refer to as the competitive scholarships because each of those three have both an additional application and a deadline to apply. You can see that the presidential scholarship is the highest dollar amount of any scholarship on here. It is certainly our most competitive, I would say our most prestigious uh, academic scholarship and probably not surprising to any of you, it also has the highest academic qualifications. Students, in order to uh, be considered for the presidential, need to actually have a 3.9 GPA or higher and a 31 ACT or higher. So again, pretty steep academically. 
Um, it does have the additional application and its application deadline is our very earliest application deadline. It is December 1st. So again, to be considered for the presidential uh, scholarship, a student needs to apply by December 1st. Um, and the application is not the final step. After a student completes that application, there is also an interview process that is part of the presidential uh, award process. And that usually takes place in late January or early February. Something that's cool about the presidential, especially if you're a student from outside of Missouri, is not only does it come with that $15,000 scholarship, but if you're from out of state, you also get a waiver of the out of state portion of tuition. So that's an additional $8,100 essentially that you would get with the presidential. Uh, the next competitive, the Inclusive Excellence, is a scholarship that really celebrates students who excel in you know, the areas of diversity and inclusion. It's also going to have a separate application, but its deadline will be later. The presidential was December 1st, but the Inclusive Excellence deadline isn't until January 30th, so it is going to be a little bit later. Uh, the application will take a little bit extra work, but unlike the presidential, it will not require an interview. Uh, the application itself is what we use to award the Inclusive Excellence Scholarship. But like the presidential, not only do you get that dollar amount that's listed here, if you earn the Inclusive Excellence Scholarship, you also, if you're from out of state, get that $8,100 waiver of out of state tu tuition. So another sweet perk of the Inclusive Excellence. And then finally, I'll mention the Centennial Leaders, also a separate application. Also a deadline, but it is a little bit later as well. It is January 30th to apply for the Centennial Leaders. And that particular scholarship is uh, aimed at students who have excelled in really three of the four areas that include leadership, volunteerism, athletics, and performing arts. That one does come with an interview and those interviews typically will take place in eh, late February, maybe early March. So those are the three competitive awards. Again, they all have differing deadlines. Uh, I do want to specifically point out as well, especially since the majority of our students here tonight are from Missouri, the a Recognition Scholarship. The a program is very popular here in Missouri, and many, many high schools have the a program. The a Scholarship that Missouri State offers, you can see right there, is $500 per year, um, and it's renewable for up to four years. However, this is a really important detail, it is not stackable or it is not combinable. So if you do earn a scholarship that has a higher dollar amount than the A+, you won't be able to put the A+, on top of it. So again, does not stack. Um, and I think with that, sleet, or that, Stephen, we're ready for the next slide. All right, so this chart, everyone, these are the automatic scholarships at Missouri State. Now the previous slide, those scholarships all had some sort of special qualification. For instance, the, you know, the boy state, the girl state, you needed to have participated in that program. The only qualifications you need for our three automatic scholarships are a particular GPA and a particular standardized test score. And the way this chart works is you wanna find where your qualifications meet. So you wanna find the column of your GPA that's going across the bottom, and then you want to find the row of your test score and going up, you can see where you might meet. Um, let's actually dive in a little bit deeper to each of those qualifications. As far as the GPA, if your high school does not use a 4.0 scale, we will just convert your GPA, whether it's on, on a five point or an 11 point, uh, we'll just convert that to a four point, the equivalent four point. If your high school does a weighted GPA, so you get actually some extra consideration for honors classes or college prep classes, we will also use that weighted GPA for this consideration. So that can definitely be to your benefit. And then finally, this can always change. We will look at your transcript up through your final high school transcript, up through graduation. So even if your GPA is at a certain level right now, say when you have applied, that could increase throughout senior year and that could possibly move you up on this scholarship. Let's then break down the test score requirement. And it looked like most of you, many of you, have been able to take a test at this point. We understand, as Steve mentioned, that has been a challenge this year. 
Uh, but it is prudent as you plan for Missouri State scholarships to assume that this scholarship will still have a testing requirement. If that changes, that's certainly a high priority for us to let you know, and we'll keep you updated. But again, I think it's pretty prudent to just assume that that test requirement will be there. You can see that we take either the ACT or the SAT, whichever uh, that you prefer, whichever that you uh, end up taking. For the very first time this year, the very first time, we are accepting both for admission and for scholarships, super scores. And so what that means is if you take the test multiple times, you do want to make sure you send us all of your results because if the different subject tests from your exams allow us to build an even higher super score, we will use that and that's good for you when it comes to scholarships. The last update I do want to give on the testing requirement is that you also can update this. It doesn't go quite as far. So again, your GPA, you can go all the way to graduation. With the test, you can actually retake the test up through April of 2021, if you're a senior this year, and send us a new score and possibly increase the scholarship. So we try to be as flexible as we can with uh, improving your qualifications for these scholarships. There's not going to be any separate application for these automatic scholarships. Just quickly, down at the bottom, you can see the, the three categories and the three dollar amounts. Of another perk of these three automatic scholarships is if you are from outside of the state of Missouri, not only do you get that scholarship amount, but again, you are going to get a waiver of your out-of-state portion of tuition. So you're going to get about 8100 bucks again, just for uh, being from out of state and qualifying for this scholarship. And I'll point out just quickly that $1,000 for housing is good as long as you live on campus. Uh, this was asked as a question, so I'm going to go ahead and address it here. You are going to be required to live on campus for the first year. The only exception is if uh, you reside within 45 miles of our campus, you do have the option of living at home. But uh, if you don't commute from home, you would be required to live on campus. That additional thousand would be good as long as you lived on campus. But as soon as you chose as an upperclassman to move off campus, you would lose that additional benefit. And Steve, ready for the last slide of scholarships. All right. So I've mentioned already that a few of these scholarships do give you um, out of state, an out-of-state tuition waiver. But it's hope is not lost if you don't qualify for one of those previous scholarships, because you can see there are two different ways here to also qualify for that out of state tuition waiver. The first one is purely academic. You can see that there are four criterion that uh, matter for that. What's really important to know about the out of state tuition waiver is you don't need to have all four of those qualifications. You don't even need to have two of those four you only have to have one. If you meet one of those four criterion, then you will qualify automatically for the out-of-state tuition waiver. The continue the tradition waiver there on the right is a legacy waiver. So that's for students who reside out of state, but at least one of their parents or one of their grandparents graduated from Missouri State. Uh, those with a short application just to verify who that relative was, you could actually get uh, in-state tuition that way. So that's a little bit about our scholarships. I will hand it back to Steve. You there, Steve? Yep. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Uh, very good information. So we talked about uh, Missouri State scholarships. I want to focus a little bit on private scholarships. As I said before, we should always be looking for the free stuff, and that includes private scholarships. Some of the best resources are actually those closest to you. For example, someone in your church may know of a scholarship that their student applied for and can suggest it to you. So don't, uh, don't overlook hidden resources from others that you have a, a connection with. Social media is often an overlooked resource for scholarships. Many colleges and universities tweet and post information about private scholarships. And the beauty in this 
is that these scholarships that they're posting can often be applied to the school of your students choosing. In other words, we're trying to push out information to help all students. Sure, we may push information about institution specific scholarships, but that's not all that we, that we post and publish. There are lots of schools in the country. So even if you are set on going to Missouri State, cast your scholarship net wider by following other institutions or reading their websites for scholarships that they, can rec that they recommend. Just like everyone else, you're a unique individual and there may be a scholarship for something that is near and dear to your heart. If, for example, your feet are two different sizes or you play a musical instrument, harp on that and play it to your advantage. Look for the scholarships that are specific to you, the, the weird ones, the obscure ones. And then surprisingly, banks or credit unions. Banks are probably less known for their philanthropy, but they're in the money business for better or worse. Check with whomever you bank with and see what scholarships they offer. And then before you kiss high school goodbye, check with your counselor. Their goal, like mine, is to help students be successful. And it may be that they know of some scholarships, both local and general, which could be pertinent to you. In fact, two of my scholarships when I was a student came from my school district, and I learned about those just by talking to my high school counselor. The cool thing about private scholarships is that they can almost always be combined or stacked with other scholarships and grants. Okay, we've talked about scholarships. Let's talk about FAFSA. I think we have another poll, a quick one about FAFSA and see who's completed it. Take a minute or so and we will look at those results in just a bit. And since this is a short poll, we'll give another 15 seconds or so. Nope, oh, sorry, there it goes. All right, and we'll take a look at who's completed their FAFSA. All right. This pleases me as someone whose job centers around the FAFSA, uh, that you've either completed or plan to complete the FAFSA. If you're not going to complete the FAFSA, I would say do it anyway, because the first F in FAFSA stands for free. So there's no cost to you, literally no cost to you other than a bit of your time. And uh, I can't think of a single downside of completing the FAFSA. Before you do the FAFSA though, you'll need what's called an FSA ID. This is a username and password, gives you access to filing the FAFSA. For those of you who have one, great. Make sure that a parent has one as well since parent information will probably be required on the FAFSA. There are two separate logins, one for student, one for parent, and never the twain shall meet. Okay, a little bit ago, we mentioned federal work study. Uh, we get a lot of questions about this. It's common for a parent to have had work study in college and want the same for their student. And it's a terrific way to gain work experience with lower risk in a forgiving environment. But at Missouri State, the work study money that we have to give is very limited. This is why a small number of the 3,100 student jobs we have on campus each year are work study jobs, just a, small, a relatively small portion. Also, not all students will qualify for work study either. At Missouri State, you need to qualify for a Pell Grant, which means having filed a FAFSA and have a significant amount of unmet financial need. And since work study funds are very limited, because this is money that comes from the government and it's not an endless vat of funds, we award work study to those who file their FAFSA early. This is another benefit of filing the FAFSA as early as you can, even on October 1st, if you can. But there are actually more jobs on campus that do not require a student to be awarded work study. 
If you're considering having a job while a student at Missouri State, I applaud you, but promise me that you will not lose focus on your academics since that is the core reason you chose to be a part of the Missouri State community. If you're considering having a job while a student, familiarize yourself with our online find a job tool. We have a top tier student employment office right here on campus and they work very, very hard to post both on and off campus jobs, work study and non work study jobs. In fact, as you can see, we post more off campus student job openings on our website than work study jobs. So if you're focused on getting that work study position, you may actually be limiting yourself. Look at other options if you don't have work study on your aid offer, because that's it. It, it is worth something, but it's not the only way to get a job on campus. The point I hope that I have made is that federal work study is just one of many financial aid options at Missouri State. As far as when to apply for financial aid, uh, the clock is running, but you're not out of time. No, not at all. In fact, if you have not begun to apply for financial aid, that's okay. As with most things though, the sooner we begin, the better we fare. The FAFSA is available. Your next big milestone as a student considering Missouri State University is the University Foundation Scholarship Application. This mouthful of an online application is used for many different scholarships, which are provided by our foundation, our donors. This application is available between November 1st and March 1st, so you have a large uh, period of time to complete it. And it's available for any admitted student. Again, it becomes available on November 1st. So I recommend making it a Thanksgiving or a winter break project. I wouldn't wait until the last minute to complete the application because you can submit references and short essays. Those can take a little longer to acquire, but everything is still due by March 1st. So if you submit your application at the last minute, you're, you're not giving your references much time to write a recommendation on your behalf and you're really putting yourself at a disadvantage. Matt mentioned that some of our scholarships have an, at MSU have special applications. Again, the earliest deadline of those is December 1st and that's our presidential scholarship. Not long after that, we'll begin mailing custom estimated financial aid offers to students who have filed a FAFSA and have sent it to Missouri State University. We mail aid offers continuously. So if you've not filed your FAFSA at this point, that doesn't mean you won't receive an aid offer. When we receive your FAFSA, that is when we will send you your aid offer. But the earliest that will happen is sometime around mid-December. I mentioned that Missouri residents would want to file their FAFSA before February 1st to be eligible for the Access Missouri grant. Um, again, this is a this, this is a grant for Missouri residents only with a moderate amount of financial need as determined by the FAFSA. But if you miss that FAFSA de priority deadline of February 1st, you can file your FAFSA afterwards. But if you miss that February 1st deadline, we can't guarantee you'll be eligible for the Access Missouri grant. And that's about 2000 a year on average. August 1st is when we really like students to have taken all the necessary steps to cover their cost. This includes filing a FAFSA. It includes accepting any university scholarships, which you've received. It includes sending us any scholarship checks that you received over the summer so we can apply them to your bill. And it includes having a plan to account for any amount not covered by financial aid. If this means borrowing a loan, then we hope you've accepted the loans or applied for the loans at least by August 1st. Things can absolutely fall into place after August 1st. This is a soft deadline, but by August 1st, we want students to look at their financial wellness in preparation for Missouri State and see what's missing. The campus gets pretty busy in August. So if you turn something in after this point, like a FAFSA or a loan application, it may take us a little longer to process it. And then a final note on this calendar is that we will disperse financial aid during the second week of classes. This gives you a chance to fine tune your class schedule before we pay financial aid to your account. Okay, and then the last thing I wanna talk about coming full circle is our payment plan. I talked about this a little bit uh, in the first part of this meeting. If you end up not having enough financial aid to pay your balance, that is perfectly okay. Understand that we only bill students though for one semester at a time. In August, you'll be emailed an account summary for fall tuition, again, emailed. 
fall housing, fall course fees, et cetera. The spring semester's fees won't even appear on your statement until January. So we're just looking at one semester at a time. And we'll automatically split your financial aid into two semesters and apply one half of that to your fall balance. We reserve the other half of your financial aid for your spring balance. This means that any out-of-pocket obligation you have is lower. And this out-of-pocket, if you have one, can be paid down in three monthly installments. Each installment is due by the 10th of the month, beginning in September. So September 10th, October 10th, and November 10th. By early November, when the third and final payment is due, you're going to be registering for the spring semester. And we want to make sure that you are set up for financial success before you assume another semester's worth of expenses. If November 11th comes and you have a large balance remaining, you'll have a hard time registering for spring. We hope that isn't the case. Hopefully, that won't be the case. But as I mentioned, we are all mostly friendly at Missouri State. So please come talk to us if you need help with covering your balance and we'll look at other financial aid options. Students are automatically registered for this plan and the only drawback is a monthly finance charge of 1% of whatever your balance is. So say for example, you paid your, you paid your first installment on September 10th and on the 11th you owed $1,000 on your fall balance. On the 11th, you'll see a $10 finance charge added to your balance or 1% of that $1,000. We lather, rinse, repeat, each month until the balance is paid in full. This way, uh, the university puts a lot of care into the system so we can be flexible and so we can make our university an accessible choice. With that, we're gonna try to answer as many questions as we can in the last few minutes. Um, if you have other information, or sorry, other questions that come up after tonight, feel welcome to reach out to us. We're here to help you. You have Matt's email, my direct email, and then our admissions email address. You can also uh, visit the financial aid office. Uh, we have a website. We have an email address for general questions. Give us a call during normal business hours, or like many other institutions, we're on the Twitter. Feel free to tweet us or DM us, and we will try to get your questions answered as quickly as possible. With that, we'll see how many questions we can get answered. Okay, and Steve, a couple folks have asked, and I apologize, I should have probably answered this during the scholarship section, but um, a couple folks have asked how many presidential scholarships that we award. Uh, we will offer 35 of the presidential scholarships each year. So obviously it is a very competitive scholarship. Okay, uh, there's a question about salary of jobs on campus. It, it depends. At Missouri State, we, we try to find a balance between um, being competitive with the surrounding area as far as pay goes and giving students, as many students as we can, an opportunity to gain that valuable work experience. Starting out, most jobs may stick close to minimum wage but it is possible to find jobs on campus that might pay a little bit more. It really just depends on the department you're working in. Steve, I don't know. Um, we've had a question about Florida prepaid and I'm wondering if that might be a 529. Um, I don't know if you have any experience with that. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that particular program, but it registers like a prepaid tuition plan, the 529 or the most plan uh, that we call in Missouri. And I, I don't see that question, I apologize. So the, the, the person, uh, if the attendee is still here who asked about Florida prepaid, if you wouldn't mind shooting us an email um, on that uh, contact page there, we would love to follow up about that. Let's see. The, Matt, there are a couple of questions about scholarships for legacy students, so parents, mm -hmm. students of parents who graduated from Missouri State. We talked about the out-of-state waiver. As far as in-state uh, scholarships for in-state students, our greatest opportunity, correct me if I'm wrong, would probably come from the MSU Foundation scholarship. 
I think I think you're correct. Unfortunately, the at least the institutional scholarship legacy is only for non-residents. Yeah. And I glossed over that MSU Foundation scholarship. It's a huge application for a large pool of scholarships. Uh, this is not something that the financial aid office administers. So we don't know what types of scholarships are being offered through the foundation scholarship application. In general, average award is about $1,000. We have, we've used it for over 1,200 scholarships a year in the past, but it really just depends on what the donors want to see and who they want their funds to go to. Okay, uh, more on the out-of-state fee waiver, uh, particularly, particularly with renewals. The renewal criteria are slightly different for the two out-of-state scholarships, I believe. And if your student is awarded the out-of-state scholarship, we will send them a notice and it will include the renewal criteria. Uh, it could be, there's usually a minimum GPA component and a number of credit hours completed each year. And that's important to keep track of because as we mentioned, if a student takes 14 credit hours a year, they would meet the renewal criteria for many of our scholarships, but if they take 12 hours a year, excuse me, a semester, not per year, per semester, then by the end of two semesters, they're gonna have 24 credit hours completed. If the renewal criteria means needing to pass 28 credit hours, they're gonna to need to take some classes over the summer to get them at that 28 completed past credit hour milestone. Uh, Steve, we've had a couple folks ask if um, when a family fills out a FAFSA, will the student be able to see the parents' financial information? Brilliant question. FAFSA is actually one of the things that I love about my job. It depends on how you fill out the FAFSA. If you have the opportunity, click on that little link to IRS button when you start to put in your finances. That will pull a tax return straight from the IRS database over to your FAFSA. It saves a lot of time for both student and parent filling out the FAFSA. If you do that, then no, much of the information from your tax return will not be displayed. The only people who will see that is us, the schools, and we can't give that information back out. If you don't link your tax return to your FAFSA, then you'll have to enter that information manually. If you have your tax return in front of you and you enter that information manually, it will always be visible to anybody who logs into your FAFSA unless you use the data retrieval tool. So that is my recommendation. Try to use the data retrieval tool when filling out the FAFSA so that information is redacted. It's also quick, secure, and reliable. Okay. So we've got one here. Are there any scholarships for children of employees at Missouri State? Uh, you know, I don't know about, and you may, Steve, in the, the general and departmental or the, the donor funded, there could be, I guess. But I also do believe that as an employee, you get a, a credit hour benefit, and I believe you can pass that to your children. Is that how you understand it, Steve? Yes, employees of the university can pass that benefit. I believe it's up to 15 credit hours a year uh, to children uh, and a couple of other uh, relatives. And Steve, you may have answered this, but I think it might be worth repeating to everybody. Where would you recommend students go to look for the outside scholarships? Yeah, great question. Let me back up just a bit. Okay. Um, Google. <laughs> that's, that's kind of my go-to answer. Uh, really, I mentioned, for example, banks and credit unions having scholarships. If you Google that, you're going to come up with one particular scholarship resource, scholarship website that lists the different banks that offer some sort of scholarship. Um, there are websites like Simple Tuition and Fast Web. Those operate in a similar fashion where, you're, where you would create an account and it would start to notify you of scholarships that it thinks you might qualify for. There is less vetting going on in the background with those platforms. So be careful about the scholarships you apply for through sites like Simple Tuition and through FastWeb. Those are just two. Uh, other, actually lenders 
so you've heard of names like Sally May, Wells Fargo, um, Citizens Bank. The big, the big name student lenders actually do offer scholarships as well. So you may consider looking at some of those resources. Really, look at, the, look at different schools' financial aid offices. Most will post on their website a list of scholarship resources. Missouri State has done the same thing. Uh, Simple Tuition and Fast Web are listed on there. But don't limit yourself to the scholarships listed on your intended school's financial aid page. And a great question here um, that I want to answer live, Steve, is for the competitive scholarships like the presidential, do you take the test results through April? And unfortunately for the presidential, it's actually the October test that is the last one that will be considered for the presidential. Uh, that's a little bit later for the um, Centennial Leaders, which does have the 20, I believe it's a 20 ACT requirement, so it's not going to be as steep. Um, we will still for the presidential take the super score. But if, if that's higher, but unfortunately, the October ACT is the last one for the presidential. Let's see here. This may have been on one of your slides, Steve, but we do have a question, you know, what's the web address for um, the uh, FAFSA? And I believe that's just fafsa.ed.gov. Uh, yeah, it used to be, and I have to, I actually yeah. still type that into my browser. It's, it's studentaid.gov slash h slash apply for, for aid slash FAFSA. If you go to studentaid.gov, which is the Department of Education's central hub, then it will, there will be a link right up front to filling out the FAFSA, studentaid.gov. That's also where students can log in to view how much in loans they owe or have borrowed, how they can update their FSA ID or reset that, studentaid.gov. Another FAFSA here, question here for you, Steve. If parents uh, file taxes jointly, does each parent have to put their ID uh, in and get their tax info on the FAFSA? Great question. No to the ID, yes to the tax info. Only one parent needs to have an FSA ID. But if, a, but if parents file their tax return jointly, both parents' financial information will need to be on there. Now exceptions would apply to a family whose parents apply, uh, filed their tax return jointly and then the parents separated or divorced after the tax return was filed. In that situation, only one parent's information needs to be on the FAFSA. And it's a bit tricky to separate the remaining parents' financial data from the estranged parents' financial data so that only the remaining parents' information is reported. Okay, a couple here I can answer pretty quick. You know, um, do we have to register for classes in order to receive a financial aid offer? Definitely not. Um, Steve, do we have any particular banks that we're affiliated with for, say, private loans or outside loans? Not directly affiliated, but on the Missouri State's financial aid webpage, we have something called Fast Choice. We recognize that students will borrow from the same lenders. They're usually the big name lenders. So instead of having students and families go out and shop for those loans, we've done a little bit of the pre-shopping for you. And the fast choice lender tool or short lender list basically will do, will give you an apples to apples comparison of the different loans that students borrow the most often while attending Missouri State. But no, we're not affiliated or we don't have an agreement or an affiliation with a particular bank or credit union for loan purposes. Okay. Uh, so Steve, uh, if a student um, has a sibling who's already in college and the family's already done the FAFSA, did they need to do the FAFSA again for the younger student? Brilliant question. Yes, the FAFSA is unique to the student, not the family or the parent. Fortunately, if an older sibling has already completed the FAFSA and a younger sibling needs to put the same parent information on there, parents can actually roll some of that information over to the younger students FAFSA so they don't have to re-enter it. 
Okay. How about Steve, we've got, if uh, one parent only receives military benefits, do those need to be included on the FAFSA? Great question. It depends on the kind of military benefits. Uh, veterans disability is reported on the FAFSA, but only those received in 2019. Certain benefits like basic allowance for housing and transportation may or may not be reported on the FAFSA. Generally though, non-educational benefits are included on the FAFSA. The educational benefits, the GI Bill, so chapters 31, 33, et cetera, those would not be included as income on the FAFSA, nor do they, and they also stack on top of your student's existing financial aid. So if you're receiving chapter 33 or 31 benefits, you can receive those benefits and your student can still get the full financial aid that they've applied for or been awarded. Okay. <laughs> um, this one, Steve, is can I use the IRS portal um, if the parents filed jointly? Yes, in fact, uh, you, you cannot use the IRS retrieval tool if your parents filed separately, but jointly, yes. Okay, so the opposite is actually the, the problem in that case. Yeah. Um, Steve, do you know if a grandparent set up a mutual fund for the child's education, does that have to be reported on the FAFSA? It depends. It's the great answer in financial aid is it depends. <laughs> and also go apply for more scholarships. If the student received those funds in 2019, then that income is uh, reported on the FAFSA. If the mutual fund or the, the trust is set up in the parent or in the grandparent's name, no, the value of that trust or mutual fund does not need to be reported on the FAFSA. Now, if it's in the parent's name, then yes, it does. Okay, so we've got a question, Steve, and I'll admit I don't know uh, what this is referring to, but is Chapter 35 included on the FAFSA? Are I think I know with... the answer to that one, but I don't okay. want to give wrong information, so I'm going to table that, and let's follow up on that particular question. Okay. Um, do you know too much of Steve about some of the, the say the GI Bill uh, benefits, the veterans benefits through veteran services, or do you think we should um, get this uh, particular student in touch with them? I would reach out to the financial aid office in general. Um, I have a colleague who would know the answer to that question or to these types of questions. Certainly, uh, and is certainly more versed in that particular topic than I am. As I said, I don't want to give out wrong information. Okay. And apologies, everybody, if there's a delay, I'm sorting through some questions we've already answered. Um, you know, one that came in quite a bit early, but I'm just earlier, but I'm going to reiterate this is, uh, you know, the question was, you know, we talk about a full ride to college, uh, and the question was in the context of the automatic scholarships, you know, what does it take to get school paid for entirely for four years? And you know, at Missouri State, even our top, most prestigious, most competitive award, the Presidential Scholarship, is not a pure full ride. Uh, you'll notice that it's fifteen thousand, and the sticker price estimate Steve gave you was a little bit over eighteen thousand. So it's really important when you're you know planning and hoping to get everything covered, you pursue aid from all different directions. So that's you know the scholarships from the institution, that's the outside scholarships that we've talked about, that is you know the FAFSA and the need based awards. It, it's you know much simpler, or much more feasible to get everything covered with aid from multiple sources than it is to uh, plan on a full ride from the college. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add, Steve. I know you put it very succinctly. Okay. Let's see. Uh, there's a question about scholarships and housing. If a scholarship from the university includes a housing component, then the student must live on campus or in campus housing to receive that portion of the scholarship. And do you know, Steve, off the top of your head, does that include apartments? 
I'm assuming oh, it does. I knew you were um, going to ask that question. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I believe that does. I think so as well. But if you if you ask the question about apartments that you might live in as an upperclassman, please you know send us an email to the uh, admissions at missouristate.edu, and we'd love to get you the definitive answer on that. Steve, would you mind skipping back to the um, out-of-state tuition waiver slide? We've got a request to see those qualifications again. Absolutely. And I don't know if you see there, we've got another question, Steve, about the uh, IRS portal and mm -hmm. which parent ID that the family should use if they okay. don't need to use both parents. Right. They don't need to use both parents. Um, if both parents are, uh, if both parents have social security numbers and both parents are reporting their information on the FAFSA, then it doesn't matter which parent uses their FSA ID. But if one parent has a social security number and the other parent does not, then only the parent with that social security number can uh, will be able to use their FSA ID because having a social security number is a requirement of having that FSA ID. There's a, Matt, there's a question about uh, custodial account balances and um, whether it benefits the student more to apply, the student and the parent more to apply for loans. As far as uh, things like trusts and mutual funds that are intended for the student's welfare, it depends on who the account holder is. Generally, if the parent owns the account, uh, then that value is reported on the FAFSA and it's considered an asset. If the student owns the account, then it's also reported as a student asset on the FAFSA. If the student is simply a, forget the word, custodian, I believe, then it's still considered a parent asset. And then as far as whether it's more beneficial for a student or a parent to apply for loans, this is a really great question. Loans are kind of like shopping for a car or a house. You pick the one that gives you the best rate that has the most agreeable pay repayment terms and generally for students, the federal loans that they receive through the FAFSA are going to be the better option. Right now, interest rate on federal student loans is 2.75%. That is ridiculously low. A couple of years ago, they were almost up to 7%. That's just on the student loans though. Parent loans right now, if a parent were to borrow a government loan, they'd be looking at an interest rate of 5.3%. Based on their credit worthiness, however, they may be able to go to a a different lender, a private lender, and get a better interest rate. In that case, the parent would want to entertain that private loan because it's gonna have the lower interest rate. Also keep in mind with federal loans, you know what you're getting into. The payments are, the interest rate, excuse me, is always fixed. Repayments are standard. With private loans, you may not have those flexibilities. Uh, Steve, uh, one I, I will address here real quickly is do freshmen have to have a roommate due to uh, COVID-19? There is the option to do what is called buying out your residence hall room, which means uh, you could have a room to yourself. But, you know, Steve gave you an average cost for room and board there at the very beginning. It is going to uh, add uh, pretty significantly um, to the room and board cost to buy out a room. Uh, I don't remember what exactly that is off, off the top of my head. And I don't know if you have that uh, in your head, Steve, but yeah, the, I, sorry, Matt, uh, the room buyout is one and a half times the single rate and it's a two person room and the, uh, you have to keep all the furniture in there. Okay. And Steve, we have a prior prior year question who doesn't nice. get excited about that uh the question and you may want to expand on this is does the fafsa just ask for your last year's and then they put parentheses 2020 income tax return um great question so the fafsa requires you to put in 2019 income tax information that is a federal requirement and we can't simply go into the fafsa and file the 2020, file using 2020 information if our income has changed. Um, so you have to use 2019 information to file the FAFSA initially. After that point, if your income has changed since 2019 and what you're reporting on the FAFSA doesn't accurately reflect 
your family's financial situation, it would behoove you and your student to talk to your financial aid office and see what adjustments can be made. Oftentimes, financial aid offices have the ability to look at 2020 income, but it's only something that a financial aid administrator can do. It's not something that a student or parent can update themselves. Okay, and we've got a question. You, I assume it's, should I apply for on-campus housing, say fall 2020? Um, you know, obviously that question is going to depend on, I guess, when you would be starting uh, at Missouri State, but assuming that you would be starting in fall of 2021, we envision that the um, housing application for next fall, 2021, will open later uh, this month, possibly early November. We don't have a fixed date right now, uh, but it'll be later this fall that application will open. Housing is a, a first come first serve process where the earlier once housing opens, you do complete the housing application and pay the $100 deposit, the better your odds are of getting that, say that residence hall that you really want, getting that first choice residence hall. So stay tuned, especially if you're an admitted student, stay tuned for more updates about when housing applications do open. All right, next question. Can the parent pay the student loan for them to get the lower rate? I'm, uh, I'm assuming this is referring to having a co-signer. So if a student were to, to apply for a private loan, they'd probably have a fairly high interest rate because of the absence of credit history. Having a co-signer, although not necessarily a parent, oftentimes will lower the student's interest rate. As far as who is actually paying the money, paying back the loan, the lender is blind to that and it's a bit irrelevant as long as they get their money. To, uh, we just had a question come in about housing um, that asked, could you go ahead and put down the $100 payment to hold the room? Uh, that's a great question. And um, no, you do need to be admitted. And again, the housing application needs to be open. So you definitely still have time to apply uh, and get your admissions decision before that opens. But um, it does have to be open officially until before anybody can apply and pay that $100 housing deposit. And then we had a question about, you know, if your ACT score is delayed um, for one of the competitive scholarships, especially, um, but maybe even for one of the automatic scholarships, it depends, I guess, is how I would answer that. And Steve, I don't know if you have any more insight. What I would probably recommend uh, in this case is probably shooting us an email. Um, uh, you know, if there's, especially if there's a particular situation that you're worried about, um, and we could possibly, with more details, give you a better answer to uh, test score delays and how that might impact your eligibility for certain scholarships. Exactly. With financial aid, it depends. Well, Steve, I think we might have made it to the end of our question supply. Well done, chap. <laughs> Bravo. Um, oh. I see someone has raised their hand. Is that a question? Oh, yeah, uh, I'll quickly answer this one. You know, the GPA required to get admission does depend, you know, just like Steve said, uh, it depends. Um, if a student has above a 3.25 uh, high school GPA, and that could be weighted or unweighted, we would admit them without a test score so long as they also meet our core curriculum requirements. And you can easily find online our admission requirements. Uh, we try to make it really clear uh, but a 3.25 with no test, and then actually depending on a student's test score, the GPA could go all the way down to a 2.5, uh, but again, that's gonna depend on how high their test score is. So could definitely check that out. But I think everybody, we are going to go ahead and wrap up our uh, our first ever virtual financial aid night. I think I can speak for Steve in saying that we really appreciate everybody attending tonight. We hope it was informative. Uh, again, if you would go ahead and fill out our survey, we would really appreciate it. And we will follow up early next week with a link to the video recording. So again, thank you, everybody, and have a great Thursday night.